Professor Noel Reynolds, um, who retired after many years teaching political science, political philosophy at BYU, but along the way has shown a, uh, a very strong interest and has written on uh, topics relating to the interpretation of scripture, um, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and particularly chiasmus. And he will be addressing chiasmus and Hebrew rhetoric. Well, good morning. I've really enjoyed this. Uh, I've learned a lot from the presentations that have gone before, and I want to say that uh, I see myself uh, uh, basically uh, in sync with them in terms of uh, how you can evaluate, uh, identify uh, chiasms. Um, I want to bring to the discussion, however, a broader perspective. Uh, I think we can uh, miss a lot uh, if we limit ourselves to this question, what is a chiasm? I, I personally don't think that the people who were writing these things uh, in the Bible ever asked that question. Uh, I think from their perspective, they were applying certain kinds of principles to their writing, principles that they had learned uh, in uh, scribal schools or whatever, uh, the, um, during the last 50, 60 years, uh, there has been a, a, new, a kind of a, a new development or an ex uh, intensified development in biblical studies uh, that has, uh, in many quarters, taken on the label Hebrew rhetoric. And the um, assumption of the scholars who have uh, identified this tradition, uh, say that they see it having developed in the 8th and 7th centuries BC, uh, right up to about 600 BC, that that was the period where it developed, and that it uh, uh, was a rich set of rhetorical principles that were shared, that any writer could use and manipulate and exp exploit in the ways that seem to fit their particular uh, materials. And so uh, chiasmus was one piece of that tools, toolkit. And so as I go through this, uh, I hope you'll see what I'm trying to do is to show how a, an expanded view of, of the context in which the uh, reverse parallelism could be used by writers in that tradition uh, can help us uh, uh, to get uh, a better handle on this notion of identifying and, and evaluating. Um, and then at the end, the last half of the paper, what I plan to do is use an example from the Book of Mormon that has been instructive for me uh, to present it to you as a possibility uh, from this point of view of Hebrew rhetoric and to see how it would help us understand some of this uh, in a new way. Uh, so uh, I'll start with that uh, preface. Uh, although biblical chiasmus was identified uh, two centuries ago, it did not find a systematically supportive home in biblical studies until rhetorical criticism came onto the scene in the middle of the last century. In his 1968 presidential address at the Annual Society of Biblical Literature uh, meeting, James Muhlenberg argued that like so many other movements in biblical studies, the form critical approach that shaped his career had exhausted its potential, and that it was time to move on to a broader rhetorical analysis of the biblical text in the form in which they have come down to us. His timing proved prophetic as the talk provoked a widespread effort over the next few decades to identify the rhetorical patterns and expectations of Hebrew rhetoric as it had developed in the 8th and 7th centuries uh, before Christ. A much more complete picture of Hebrew rhetoric emerged from the rhetorical studies of the last half of the 20th century. Uh, two basic elements of Hebrew rhetoric had been recognized much earlier differentiating it from classical Western rhetorical principles. First, repetition is rampant in biblical writing. 
and often annoyed interpreters and translators, leading some to the view that many texts were jumbles of random components. Today, repetition is understood as a fundamental structuring feature uh, of text and key to their interpretation. Second, parallelism was recognized first in poetic passages in successive lines of text, but now is understood to provide a unifying principle in texts of different lengths and different characters. The rhetorical criticism of the late 20th century identified two more basic principles of Hebrew rhetoric. The first is sometimes labeled demarcation. Because of the discovery that text units of all different kinds and lengths are usually marked rhetorically at their boundaries. Uh, we've seen a little bit of that in previous presentations today. While inclusio is the most common tool used for demarcation of text units, other rhetorical figures provide their own obvious boundary markers. Uh, because I will refer to inclusion again, I, would pr uh, I should perhaps explain that an inclusio is formed when a writer repeats at the end of a text unit a prominent word or phrase from the beginning of that text unit, using the two as bookends to mark its boundaries. The second new principle to be emphasized in Hebrew rhetoric is, uh, I think, a little harder to get a, our heads around, and it's the idea of subordination, although we've also seen examples of that already this morning, particularly the example from Breck. Um, I think was a, a good example. Subordination derives from the recognition that rhetorical structures are often layered. Uh, longer text units may exhibit a, an overall collective pattern, but they may also be subdivided into smaller units that have their own rhetorical structures, which may in turn be subdivided again and even again. Uh, it should also be noted that studies in ancient Ugaritic and Hebrew poetry were reaching similar conclusions by the end of the 20th century. Pervasive parallelisms beyond those apparent in adjacent lines of text were seen to create concentric ripples of meaning resonating throughout multiple levels of textual structure. And recurring devices like inclusion for marking the boundaries of textual units at these various levels were understood and appreciated more and more. At the same time, scholars were growing increasingly skeptical of the traditional effort to establish a hard distinction between prose and poetry in those ancient literatures. Uh, I want to offer a mathematical analogy which actually has surfaced in some forms already. It has occurred to me that a mathematical analogy might help us understand these fundamental differences between the rhetorical patterns we have inherited from the Greeks and subsequent Western culture and the more complex forms we find in Hebrew rhetoric. This same analogy may also help explain the fundamental difficulty of developing set standards for the identification and evaluation of chiasms in the Bible and its related literatures. Western education tends to regard any text as a one-dimensional sequence of words, like a line, that develops logically and augments meaning as it proceeds. But most rhetorical structures based on repetition and parallelism are minimally two-dimensional in the, that meanings are expanded and augmented through connections being made across text units, connections that skip over the intervening text. Chiasmus provides a simple example when it is diagrammed with a two-dimensional matrix. Two dimensions are manageable for many tools of analysis. However, it gets a lot more complicated. Demarcation and subordination create multi-dimensional texts with their multi-layered approach using structures within structures, each developing their own internal logics while simultaneously contributing to meanings in the levels above. The idea of one logical line of development is exploded as added dimensions are themselves expanded repeatedly into further additional dimensions. 
I have been encouraged in this analogy uh, recently by the discovery, that, the discovery that students of biblical poetry have been using similar explanations. Now there have been some recurring complaints about rhetorical approaches. Three recurring criticisms of studies based in rhetorical criticism are instructive for anyone choosing to employ this approach. First, efforts to establish standard criteria for the evaluation of uh, proposed chiasms or other rhetorical figures have enjoyed limited success and continue to be problematic in many applications. From the perspective of writers within this tradition, the four principles listed above and the multiple rhetorical figures being used offer a potentially infinite array of combinations of rhetorical structures that they can apply in the composition of any particular text. And the writer's personal creativity can produce original combinations and even unique variations time and time again. The most successful evaluations of any particular rhetorical form focus on an assessment of how successfully the writer has adapted the form to communicate or enhance meaning in the attempt to persuade readers as part of the interpretation of the text in its larger context. The standards that tend to come to mind in the evaluation of individual examples, and we've seen a lot of these this morning, it's very helpful presentations on that. Um, these standards can all be violated in artful composition of effective texts. We should not be surprised to discover that most actual examples of chiasms and other related rhetorical figures will have some unique features and may even deliberately stray from the standard model for rhetorical effect. Second, a surprising number of biblical studies based in rhetorical criticism have proven to be nothing more than searches for examples of particular rhetorical structures, with chiasms being the most popular objects of these hunting expeditions. Uh, these complaints have already been reported uh, several times this morning. No doubt, this, in this tendency has been a primary motivator for the recurring efforts to set up objective standards for the identification of chiasms. Again, it seems to me, the better response might be to evaluate each rhetorical structure encountered in a text ac according to its effectiveness in contributing to the communication and promotion of the thesis of that text. The third criticism, scholars of classical and modern rhetoric have increasingly reminded biblical scholars of Aristotle's stale undisputed axiom that the bottom line function of all rhetoric is to persuade and not to implement abstract rules or forms. Evaluations of chiasms and other rhetorical figures need to keep their effectiveness for illumination and persuasion constantly in view. Now, I am going to turn to uh, the Book of Mormon and look at the writings of Nephi as a case study. So how, how does this idea and these principles of biblical rhetoric, or, uh, Hebrew rhetoric apply? Uh, and, uh, I will, and this for this, I will be using uh, handouts that are in your program, I think starting on page 16. Uh, I'm not using slides because uh, I think you may want to peruse these while I'm talking. You may want to go back and look at one you've already looked at, but to have the entire thing in mind as we go along. I'm not quite to, this, to the handouts yet, but will be very shortly. As appreciation for chiasmus has grown in biblical studies over the last century, scholars have also come to recognize the chiastic organization of longer and more complex texts. Chiasmus was first noticed in brief poetic passages based in word repetition. And incidentally, for, for a lot of folks, and you've even seen that this morning, uh, the idea of chiasmus seems to require repetition of words. Uh, the, the Hebrew rhetoric approach uh, goes beyond that and sees lots of other possibilities. Uh, today's scholars recognize that chiasms can feature repetition of phrases, concepts, 
speakers, historical events, grammatical structures, or almost anything that may suit an author's purposes or materials, and that can be framed in a parallel way for added meaning or persuasive effect. And they also have grown comfortable with the insight that reverse parallelism, parallelism can be used to structure texts of basically any length. The writings of Nephi constituting the first 55 chapters of the Book of Mormon provide an opportunity to illustrate many of these points in a context that most of you in the audience may appreciate. Nephi's opening sentence emphasizes the fact that he was educated in Jerusalem at the end of the seventh century, at the very time that Hebrew rhetoric is now believed to have reached the height of its development in the scribal schools of Jerusalem. Nephi divided his writings quite artificially into two books, with no break in the action between the two. Nephi's first book ends in a meeting in which Nephi and his father Lehi are preaching to Nephi's rebellious brothers. And book two continues the discourse in the very same meeting. The reader who is sensitized to rhetorical criticism will immediately suspect that the break between the two books is necessary for reasons of rhetorical structure that are independent of the flow of the story. Rhetorical analysis of the 22 chapters of the first book shows that these are structured around two chiasms. This system of double parallels is anchored in the six stories told in the book, stories that are written to be parallel to each other in a clear pattern. The rhetorical purpose of the book is announced clearly at the beginning. I, Nephi, will show unto you that the tender mercies of the Lord are over all those whom he hath chosen according to their faith, to make them mighty, even unto the power of deliverance. This thesis is proven repeatedly in the six stories, and then collectively, as Lehi's party finally and miraculously arrives against all odds in their promised land. The rhetorical purpose of the second book is also clearly announced. For we labor diligently to write, to persuade our children and also our brethren to believe in Christ and to be reconciled to God. This is all 2 Nephi chapter 25. And again, only five verses later we read, For the words which I have spoken are sufficient to teach any man the right way. And chiastically, for the right way is to believe in Christ and deny him not. While the stories told in 1 Nephi show how God delivers his faithful followers from evil and captivity in this life, 2 Nephi takes the theme to the next level, showing all men how they can be delivered from the evils of this world by following the gospel taught by Jesus Christ into eternal life. Rhetorical analysis of, the, of Nephi's second book now reveals that it is far from being a random collection of leftovers, as it has often been thought by me and other commentators to be. Uh, you will find a set of handouts now, uh, as I've mentioned in your program, uh, that show you how I see this material being informed by the practices of Hebrew rhetoric. Handout number one. Now the first, remember the first job of rhetorical analysis from the point of view of Hebrew rhetoric is to break the text into its subunits, uh, textual units. Uh, handout one shows how the 33 chapters of Second Nephi can be sorted nicely into 13 text units. So if you follow those, those uh, uh, down the left hand column, you'll see the units of text and notice the entire text is concluded. Nothing is left out. Uh, falls into 13 text units, all of which are demarcated by inclusios. Uh, so that there's, each of these is set apart as an inclusio. 
most of them are pretty clear. Some of them are a little dicey. And so uh, uh, I'm not claiming that this is uh, uh, totally proven and, and can't be criticized. But, it, but for, uh, I think it will help us get to the point of how we evaluate chiasm. So that's uh, what I'm aiming at here. Um, the middle column in that uh, uh, table number one, it's the handouts are actually labeled at the bottom where it says handout one. Um, that shows you what the phrase is that is used to mark the inclusio, that middle column. So it's the recurrence of that phrase that marks that. In the third column, I've given each of these 13 sections of the text a label. And uh, you'll see immediately that, uh, that I'm saying that it has a chiastic uh, structure because of the labels that I've assigned. The often unnoticed or at least unremarked chapter 11. I, I've, since I did this, I've been asking people who teach Book of Mormon, so what's in chapter 11? The second Nephi, nobody knows. Uh, it somehow escapes our, our focused attention. Uh, and I've labeled it here as text unit G, and that's how you hear me referring to it. G emerges as the center or the pivot point for the book length chiasm of Second Nephi. So now handout two shows how the thematic and terminological content of these 13 inclusios display a chiastic arrangement for all of Second Nephi. So now what you see on table two is not the markers that enable me to, to demarcate the 13 inclusios, but rather what's in each of those inclusios, uh, the content, the theme, that will give it a parallel relationship uh, in the uh, book length chiasm. I hope that's clear. Um, our time today is limited, but I will now show how an analysis of that one chapter 11 from the perspective of Hebrew rhetoric employs rhetorical substructures in a way that gives meaning and purpose to every word of the text both in terms of the smallest textual subdivisions and of the text levels above them. My point here will not be to argue that I have presented the best possible interpretation of this text, but rather to show how it incorporates the chiastic principle of reverse parallelism at different levels in ways that would seem to seriously challenge most of our proposed methodologies for identifying and evaluating chiastic structures uh, objectively. So let's go to uh, table three then, and that's the, uh, and what this gives you is the breakdown then of that G, the, 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 mid, the middle chapter in the uh, larger uh, book, and uh, it also has a chiastic structure that I try to display in table three, or handout three. The boundary markers for the inclusio that constitutes the last seven verses of chapter 11 are provided quite clearly through repetition of the simple statement, and now I, Nephi, write some more of the words of Isaiah. Um, so that, that statement is just repeated, uh, and that gives us the boundary markers, but also gives us the first and last part of the chiasm. Uh, in handout three, we see how this brief text containing 313 words in only 12 sentences, divides readily into eight chiastically organized smaller text units. As each of these structures is substructures is analyzed alongside its parallel unit in the chiastic structure, A with A star, uh, B with B star, and so forth, uh, which is what I will do next, uh, much new insight is offered about Nephi's writing purposes and the more subtle themes of his second book. Uh, handouts four through seven take up each of the four pairs of elements in this chiasm for separate interpretation and evaluation. You can see in handout four that the eight element chiasm of G is framed by two parallel triplets. So we're now on handout four, right? And the A and A star are, they're not chiasms, they're another uh, rhetorical form. Uh, you can call it a triplet, has three lines, um, and 
uh, you see the similarities uh, that, that are there. Um, but as with Hebrew uh, poetry generally, the second element in a parallel structure provides added or intensified meaning by adding phrases or changing some of the words. The first lines in each of these triplets, the A lines, are virtually identical, providing this central unit text with, uh, of G with an easily recognizable inclusio, which frequently signals that the material within the inclusio may be structured as another chiasm, as G indeed turns out to be. But line B, and I, it was long after I had designed these that I realized I'm presenting this orally, and uh, when I say A, you may be wondering whether I mean capital A or small a. Uh, I apologize for that, and I hope you can keep straight, and I'll try and help you. But, but the line B's, talking about the small B's, in the second triplet, A star, adds meaning as Nephi's personal delight in Isaiah's words in the first A now is, uh, becomes the rejoicing of his people for all men. And in line C and C, just as Nephi could liken Isaiah's words unto his people in A, in the first uh, in the introductory triplet, uh, so his leader, readers are invited in A star to liken these words unto themselves and unto all men. In this way, the first pair of parallel elements in G, the A and A star, introduce us to the universalizing theme of the second half of Second Nephi. Now, as displayed in handout five, the second pair of parallel elements, that's B and B star, presents a much more complicated text and might escape detection as a pair were not the following two pairs, C, C star, and D, D star, so obvious, driving us back to look more carefully for B, B star. As analyzed in handout five, B presents us with two very different but closely linked rhetorical structures. The first and last lines of the first structure are nearly identical. The difference between A and A star uh, is uh, that them, referring to the words of Isaiah, becomes their words in a star, the words of Isaiah and Jacob. But inside the inclusio that we have here, we find not another chiasm, but instead a form known by biblical rhetoricians as alternating parallels. Lines B and B star are obviously similar, as each reports that a different prophet, Isaiah and Jacob respectively, has seen the Redeemer. Lines C and C star each contain Nephi's personal and repeated witness that he also has seen the Redeemer. Uh, we have to recognize this is a very major point in Nephi's writing to make this claim. The second rhetorical structure contained in B, so stepping down below the line, uh, turns out to be a short chiasm that steps aside from the dramatic historical facts Nephi has just reported to explain why those facts amount to a proof to Nephi's children that his witness of the Redeemer is true. God has given the standard that the word of three witnesses is proof of his word, possibly alluding to Deuteronomy, and Nephi has provided three eyewitnesses. And God has sent and will send more witnesses. The theme of proving the prophecies of Christ before he comes is what binds B and B star together as parallel elements in the larger chiasm G. Now, B star picks up the proof theme, but in a new way, offering a logical proof that from theological reasoning. While this brief passage composed of seven very short clauses may not satisfy a modern reader's learned preference for syllogisms, it is clearly framed rhetorically as a chiasm composed principally of antithetically parallel elements. Line A star positively contradicts the negative hypothesis raised in A, and B star positively negates the negative conclusion proffered in B. The central lines, C, C star, state and restate the counterfactual conclusion to be drawn from A and B 
that neither we nor creation itself could exist without God, a fundamental premise that was likely accepted universally in 7th century Israelite and quite possibly in all ancient Middle Eastern cultures. The final independent clause in B needs uh, separate attention. Uh, it is not part of its chiastic structure. It does extend the teaching about Christ with Nephi's affirmation that Christ will come in the fullness of his own time. The important additional information drawn from the visions received by Nephi, Lehi, Jacob, and Isaiah that has not yet been articulated in the series of proofs. By completing or rounding out what has been said in the rhetorical form, this line fills the role that biblical rhetorician Jack Lundbaum recognizes as a ballast line, as he and others find these frequently bringing balance at the conclusion of small rhetorical structures in biblical writing. Now turn to handout six. The repetition of the opening line, A, in C and C star, supplemented by the common content of lines B, in each is more than sufficient to establish the parallelism of these two short elements in the chiasm. Uh, I think this one's fairly obvious, so I'm going to uh, let me, uh, in the middle of your page, the way it is given there, there's an or, an alternative analysis. I now don't subscribe to that one, so I'm just using the one at the top and the bottom. Um, and I think you can see uh, how both of those are, uh, the, and here we have the language is so parallel, but the structures are not. Uh, and uh, I'm going to skip now and go to the last one, handout seven which gets us to the center of the uh, chiastic structure of the chapter. With D and D star as shown in handout seven, we have finally arrived at the rhetorical center of second Nephi, not only of this chapter, but of the whole book. Here, two triplets face each other in the chiastic structure of G. Their equivalence in a parallel structure is provided once again by starting each triplet with the same principal clause, my soul delighted. To the extent this pair of triplets constitutes a turning point for all of 2 Nephi and simultaneously for its central text unit G, we are led once again to the comparison between 1st and 2nd Nephi. The first triplet in D expresses Nephi's delight in the covenants of the Lord made with our fathers, which we should understand to include specifically Abraham, Moses, and all Israel at Sinai, and most recently Lehi. The second, D star, turns our focus to the atonement of Jesus Christ, which Lehi, Nephi, and Jacob now understand as the mechanism through which the Lord has established his gospel as part of the great and eternal plan of deliverance from death, and as the fuller understanding of the ancient covenants as demonstrated in the forward-looking significance of the law of Moses as just discussed. I skipped over that. Uh, well, I have offered a brief summary analysis of the rhetorical structure of Nephi's writings, which I have suggested should be seen as a single unit rhetorically. Nephi divided his text quite artificially into two books, each with its own internal structure, but also linked them thematically to the other. The second book is further divided into 13 smaller texts by using inclusios. I have taken the central one of these and divided it further, into eight chiastically arranged subsections, each of which contains, in turn, one or more small rhetorical structures which relate in a parallel way with their partner subsection in the chiasm. This adds up to five rhetorical levels, each with its own structure. Chiasmus appears to provide the organizing principle for several of these structures at the different levels. The question then that I would like to plant with this analysis the question it poses for us today is, can we devise an objective method for the identification and evaluation of chiasms that would work for texts like this one I have described today? The analysis I have offered claims that Nephi has used the tools of Hebrew rhetoric effectively to accomplish his purposes in these two books. If this is an effective use of Hebrew rhetoric, what does it tell us about our efforts to set up objective criteria for chiasms. Thank you. Now we have just a few minutes for questions, then afterwards we'll have an open discussion among all of the presenters in this session. So here are some questions for you. 
Um, the first question, I, I, I'm glad somebody asked this because I think it's been implicit in several questions that have come forward. Is the use of chiasmus merely a tool of Hebrew literature or was it more singularly used to identify sacred persuasive text? Um, uh, there was a time uh, when the chiasmania swept through Mormonism uh, 20, 30 years ago that people were using the presence of chiasm to be an indicator of inspiration uh, in the text. Uh, that, uh, I think what you're hearing this morning is that's uh, a wrong way to think about it. It may be that inspired writings have used chiasmus, uh, the, the reverse parallelism principle, because those people learned that. I'm, I'm saying that about Nephi. He had learned how to do that. That's why he's using it, not because it's inspired. Uh, the, uh, it would be, I think all of us that have spoken so far would say, we're making a mistake if we try and link, um, make something sacred because it has chiasmus in it. That's not right. And, and Hebrew writing, and we also can't say that it's Hebrew because it has chiasmus in it. Uh, there's a lot of things that, uh, uh, um, Latin poetry, for example, Latin love poetry, which you wouldn't want to translate and read before an audience like this, uh, uh, uses the chiastic principle. Well, uh, so it can be used for lots of different purposes, including physics text, right? Um, in the first present uh, presentation this morning, the speaker said uh, for a chiasm to be real, uh, there are, they must have used it deliberately. At the first of your presentation, you seem to say the opposite, that the use of chiasmus form was not consciously in the mind of the author. Oh, well, I should be clear that uh, in the example I've given you with Nephi, I don't think there's any question in my mind uh, that he is guided by a principle that he has used. He, that he has learned. Reverse parallelism is one way of um, helping to convey meaning. Uh, in Western education, we've learned uh, that um, we develop meaning, you know, going down the line, uh, one word at a time, um, and that uh, the we can almost everything we want to say to people, we pack it into the actual words that are used, and we're. We pay a lot of attention to using the correct word at the correct time. What we're telling you is that uh, with uh, Hebrew rhetoric and, and other rhetor complicated rhetorical forms, they're teaching you that meaning is communicated by words and by the form in which they're presented. And the form also has a message for you. And the way things are related in the form and the way the different parts of the form refer to each other help you to elaborate clarify, expand uh, meaning. Um, so yes, I, I, I think uh, by and large, when you find a real chiasm, uh, that uh, my first assumption is that it's absolutely deliberate. If Second Nephi 11 is so unremarkable to the average reader, is that possibly an indication that the chiastic structure is not valid? Yeah, possibly so. Uh, why do, I'm not trying to defend this analysis today. Uh, if, if you want to criticize it, I'd be happy to hear the criticisms. Uh, it would help me. Uh, why do chiastic structures organizing long texts tend to be criticized more frequently than those in smaller texts? Well, again, it's back to the point. It's it, the easiest form, and the, 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 it, how was chiasmus first recognized, discovered in this kind of writing? And it was in, uh, in poetry, in brief, very brief constructions, um, it, because it's easier to see there. But once once you start to get the idea of reverse parallelism, and then you start to notice that the authors who had learned this, they weren't taught how to write chiasms. They're taught, in my mind, I, I would, my prediction is that if we could go back and sit in on uh, scribal school in uh, 620 BC, uh, that what we would not hear them saying, what is a chiasm? That, that w they would be teaching how you can reverse uh, the direction of presentation and with your parallel structures for added effect and for added meaning. And the question would be not, is this a chiasm? 
Uh, 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 one commentator argued that there's no such word in any of the ancient literature that's emerged that we could translate as chiasm. Uh, but not that the, the question isn't, is this a chiasm? The question is, has this author used reverse parallelism effectively to communicate his meaning? And that's a different way of thinking about it. Um, and probably a good place to move on to the panel. Thank you.